right, folks on Zoom, uh, hopefully you can hear me. I turned the mic on. We tested it earlier. It seemed to be working. Just go ahead and give me a thumbs up in the. Hear me. Reacting. Okay, that one. I guess we'll just pop up. Nice. Looks good. Great. All right. Well, thanks for everybody who's joining us via Zoom. Um, if you're here with us in person as well, but uh, we'd love to have the hybrid modality so that everybody who can make it can make it. Um, and then thanks to everybody who's joining us in person as well. There's a sign-in sheet going around just to help us keep track. Um, okay. I suppose we should get into it. So welcome. Um, this is uh, our first of a new thing that we're doing with the HPC workshops. In the past, we've just offered like uh, a week of workshops where we've done a handful of different topics within one week. Uh, this semester, we're doing it a little bit differently. We're offering one workshop every week for the whole semester. This is the introductory workshop and we'll be continuing to offer these workshops pretty much every week this whole semester, same time, potentially the same place, we'll see. Uh, but um, yeah, so you know, keep in touch, uh, keep an eye on the future workshops that we'll be holding. Uh, this is going to just be a very introductory overview to the high performance computing system. So if you are new to the high performance computing system, this is perfect for you. Uh, if you have used it before, this will be a great way to refresh uh, what HPC is and uh, how to access the HPC system. So we're not gonna get into anything too crazy like uh, coding or running jobs or anything like that today. We're just gonna give a pretty high level overview. Um, come back for future workshops if you want to learn more about those things. The schedule is in our documentation. There will be periodically uh, documentation links. Thank you. Uh, here we go. Throughout the slides, uh, and the slides will be made available later on to you. So you can go click on those links, click them later. So um, actually, why don't I share the slides to you now so that you can follow through if you want to do that. This right here. Right, and I can't see where I am while I'm talking, so hopefully you can see me. Nice, okay, great. Um, and just a reminder for everybody, there is a sign-in sheet here if you haven't gotten it. Let's get up before we leave, just so we can keep track. Um, uh, so just as just to uh, get the ball rolling, um, how many of you guys have used the HPC before? Nice. So you have accounts and you have uh, signed in and, and you used it before. Have you used it through open on demand or have you used it through uh, the terminal? Both. Both. Terminal. Nice. All right. So we got some long experience. I got an account just like last, a week or two ago. Okay. Nice. Um, so yeah, uh, great that everybody has some experience with this. So um, let's go ahead and jump into the presentation. Uh, and for those on Zoom, you can feel free to drop a question in the chat anytime. For those in the room here, just feel free to raise your hand and ask a question if anything comes up. Uh, so this is our outline for today. We're going to give a basic overview of what HPC is in general, what common misconceptions people hold about HPC. Then we're going to talk about how to access our HPC here on campus. And uh, we're going to end with a little bit about the system layout. So this is going to be our roadmap for today. As I mentioned, we're not going to get into anything too technical with coding or running jobs. Uh, check back later for future workshops if you're interested in that. Um, so what is HPC used for? Feel free in the chat to say something in, and in the room, just call out anything, like what research, what types of things are HPC used for? Go ahead. Climate modeling. Climate modeling, that's a great one. Any, any others? Fluid dynamics. Fluid dynamics, very common use case. Any others? Phylogenetics. What about phylogenetics? Well, I mean, making trees, you know. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Expensive sequence comparison tasks. Expensive sequence comparison tasks. The effect of allowing forecast models for weather on campus. Mm -hmm. I believe mm -hmm. those 
Anything that involves a lot of equations. Exactly. Anything that involves a lot of, that's a good way to summarize it. Anything that involves a lot of equations, right? Um, so we'll see how many of them we got here. Uh, there's computational chemistry. I don't think that one was mentioned. That's a really big use case on the HPC. There's climate modeling, as you said. There's fluid dynamics, as you said. There's uh, bioinformatics, so like bio phylogenetics. Uh, there is <laughs> quantitative finance. There is logistics. There is uh, an emerging field of quantitative social science that's being used. Uh, we actually just met with a group yesterday who is uh, setting up their uh, social science research. So that's pretty cool. Um, as well as astronomy, and that's my background. So, uh, and many more, of course, we're not gonna be able to mention every single possible topic that people use the HPC for. This is just a select example. Um, so let's get into the overview of what an HPC is. So why do we need to use HPC? Well, if we're gonna be running highly detailed models, a laptop might not be the best way to do it. You're gonna be waiting for that code to run well into the old age. <laughs> um, so we instead want to take a different approach. So if the computation takes too long, we might want to get a more powerful computer. If the computation is too big, we might want to link multiple computers. If there are too many computations, we might need to use a separate computer for each job. And these are all problems that the HPC can solve. So what exactly is HPC? And this is a picture from our data center on campus. You're looking at Ocelote right now. Um, so the HPC is what we call a high performance computing cluster. So HPC, high performance computing, uh, which effectively means that it is a large amount of smaller computers all interlinked together to work together uh, to either work together on jobs or to be able to run many different jobs. So both of these use cases are possible. And then supercomputer is what you may have heard as a commonly used nickname for a high performance computing cluster. And these can be of a large degree of different sizes. Um, you know, we have a moderately sized HPC here at U of A. There are much larger HPCs out there. Um, and then there, of course there are smaller ones as well. So it runs a large degree of scale. So, Let's clear up some kind of, kind of uh, common misconceptions about what an HPC is. So it is not a very high performance version of a lab, right? So when people hear high performance computer, it's not a single computer that is much more advanced than something like your laptop. Uh, in fact, the components in a modern laptop, like an Apple M series, are going to be quite a bit more advanced than what you might find in an HPC. Not to say that the stuff in an HPC isn't uh, quality material, but just to say that uh, it is more production line material. The idea behind a supercomputer is that you want a very large number of processors, right? Hmm. So rather than thinking about a single sports car as a high performance computer, it's more like a fleet of moderately performing cars, right? Um, another example of a difference between a laptop and an HPC mm -hmm. is that your laptop is personal. You are the only one in control of your laptop. You can do whatever you like on your laptop. The supercomputer is shared. You have to work together with everybody else that's on the HPC. So it's a shared resource. The laptop is local. You have it right in front of you as you're using it. Uh, you can you know, push buttons, see immediate response on the screen. The supercomputer is remote. If you were to go visit the data center and look at the supercomputer, you might notice that there is not a mouse and a keyboard in that room. It is not a computer in that traditional sense. So you would access it remotely through a connection with another computer like a laptop. And you guys who have said that you've logged on via the terminal or OOD, that's exactly what you're doing. You're connecting remotely. Your laptop is hands-on. As I mentioned, it's right there in front of you. The supercomputer is hands-free. What we mean by this is that it is possible to run things that we call batch jobs. Has anybody run a batch job before? Nice. So we have a few people that have run batch jobs. That effectively means that you submit a set of instructions to the scheduler, and then you walk away. The scheduler determines when the computer will run that work, uh, and your set of instructions determines, determines what will be run. And then you know you submit your batch job, and then you walk away. The supercomputer will take care of everything for you, um, which is a, a blessing and a curse in some ways. But we'll get into the details of that later on. 
So some more common misconceptions about HPC, uh, and in particular, what happens when you use the HPC. So the first common misconception is that my code will automatically run faster. So if I take my Python script that I'm running on my laptop and I change nothing about it and I put it on the HPC, you might find that it will actually run slower. This is a common misconception. Code needs to be configured to use the parallelization that comes from HPC. So again, think about that metaphor with the Jaguar versus the fleet of Dodge Chargers, right? It's not one highly advanced computer that you're putting your program on, it's a large number of computers. So in order to take advantage of that, you need to uh, use what we call parallelization. So being able to use multiple cores, multiple CPUs to run a single program. Um, another common misconception is all nodes on a supercomputer are the same. And what we mean, what we mean by node here is just one of those components of the supercomputer. So if a supercomputer is um, a, you know, a large number of computers that are all linked together, this misconception says that all of those are exactly the same and can be used in exactly the same way. This is not true. So we have uh, a particular type of node. We'll get more into what these nodes are and how they're structured later on in this presentation. Uh, but for now, just an example of this is we have something called a login node. The login node is just meant for you to manage your files and submit jobs. It's not actually a node that is intended for computation, right? So if I log on to the HPC and I just want to run my script right, right away, there's a few steps that I have to take in order to access the computational power of the HPC and not you know, burn up the login node, which is not really intended for computation. So another common misconception is that if I, you know, if I'm running my Python script with four CPUs and then I run it with 16 CPUs, I should cut the time in one quarter, right? So this is what we call scaling. And scaling oftentimes is not exactly linear. It might not uh, cut your program in exactly the way that you would expect it for time to completion, right? Uh, so scaling can be complicated. So this is something we'll talk about later on in the course. Uh, so, but just to put it out here, this is a common misconception. Uh, so one of the main things is, does your program know that those CPUs exist? So this is called configuration. We need to be able to configure our programs in order to use the power of the HPC. So a few more. So another common misconception is I can perform any action on the HPC as I could on my own system. So on your own personal laptop, you are the administrator, you are the master, you decide what happens on your computer. Again, the HPC is a shared system, so we have uh, limitations on what can be done by users on the HPC. So HPC is a shared system, and you are not root. Root is effectively the administrator of the system. Another common misconception, sort of the inverse of the last one, is that I'm not allowed to install anything on the HPC. On the contrary, you are allowed to install things on the HPC. You're just only allowed to install them in the directories that you have access to. So on your personal laptop, when you install something, it might go into system directories. You're not able to access system directories on the HPC, but uh, you would still be able to install things in like your home directory or something else. Um, so again, system directories are off limits, but you're in control of your home. Folder. So you can, you know, if you have some program on GitHub that you want to download and compile, you can certainly do that in your home folder. So our cats, this is, these are the nicknames for the three supercomputers that we have. Um, Elgato is our senior and our smallest cluster. It was purchased by an NSF grant uh, by astronomy researchers in 2014. So it's about 10 years old and it's still kicking, not for very much longer, but it certainly is still going. And that's an imp a very impressive lifetime for a supercomputer. They don't typically last that long. Um, our middle child is Ocelote. It's not Ocelot, it's the Spanish pronunciation of the word, so Ocelote. Uh, this went online in 2016. It's quite a bit larger than Elgato. Uh, and, you know, you can see there the number of cores that it has, almost 12,000, has a number of GPUs as well. Uh, and some more details there. So this is sort of our middle child uh, supercomputer. And then our biggest, most advanced cluster as of now is Puma. This is 
or sorry, it went online in 2020. So uh, four, almost five years ago, there's about 30,000 cores on Puma. So quite a lot uh, more. <laughs> there's also a handful of GPUs and uh, it has flash storage on the compute node. So that makes, excuse me, it makes writing to disk quite a bit faster while you are running your jobs. Uh, and then one day we will have another new cat, but for now, these are the ones that we have. Um, so let's check in on what we've talked about so far. Can anybody tell me what it means when we say that the HPC is more like a fleet of Dodge Chargers than an individual Ferrari or sports car, right? What does that mean when we make that metaphor? <laughs> It's a cluster of moderate uh, level computers. It's not just one computer. It's a, it's a whole cluster of computers. Exactly. So it, it means that we have a large number of computers that are all working together rather than one highly advanced computer. Exactly. Um, and then we talked about this for a little while. So can anybody tell me one of the misconceptions that we mentioned about HPC? Yeah. I wasn't here for that part, but are you saying this is not a supercomputer? No, the HPC is certainly a supercomputer. So that's not a misconception. No. I mean, it can make my code run faster without changing anything. Without, that's the important part, right? Without changing anything. It certainly can make your code run faster, but you have to configure it the correct way. So one common misconception might be that if I just take my Python script that I'm running on my laptop and I put it on the HPC, it'll be faster. Not necessarily true. Okay, let's move on to system access. So how do we access the HPC? Here we are. So let's talk about HPC accounts. So in order to create an account, um, you'll need to go log on to the portal. And depending on the type of account you're creating, you might need to do a few different things. So let's talk about those types of accounts. The first type of account is a PI or a sponsor account. This applies to mostly faculty. So these accounts allow you to create and own groups. These accounts receive the storage and CPU time allocations. We'll talk more about those later on. Um, but the normal user accounts are ones that will need to be sponsored by those that first type of account, right? So if you're a student, if you're a postdoc, anything like this, uh, you must request sponsorship from API. And once you have been added to what we call a group, then you can receive that storage and compute allocation that the PI has been granted. So you're sort of sharing that with your PI. Question? So the uh, big uh, grant grantees, primary cases, they, um, they, they use this uh, computer. They don't have their own uh, Access well, they might, you know, there, there are groups that decide to invest in their own compute infrastructure. This is just the compute infrastructure that we have available on campus. So any PI can gain access to this. But they might have access to a big NSF computer. Yes. So this is just their own, this is what we have on campus. Here. There are other types of compute resources out there. And certainly a lot of people uh, split some of their work between the agents here on campus as oh, well. Yeah, on the inside. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, okay. You have some sound coming through Zoom. If you are and want to ask a question, please raise your hand and we will get to you. Otherwise, please stay mute. Thank you very much. Um, does that answer your question? All right. <clears throat> um, so there are two types of groups that. Uh, users can be added to. We have research groups. This is the most commonly type or commonly used type of group. So members of research groups will receive access to both storage and CPU. So effectively, if you join a PI who's using the HPC for their research, you would join their research group and then be able to run all of your analysis on the HPC. Uh, there are also class groups. There might be uh, sort of courses that students might join where they'll use the um, HPC, but receive limited access to storage and CPU. So, hey, Ethan. Yes. <clears throat> There's a question in the chat okay. about whether staff research scientists could be designated as PIs. 
<clears throat> so generally the answer is we go by university designation as staff. Mm -hmm. And so if the university says you are a PI, then that's what we support. Okay. If the university says you're not a PI, then we don't support. We just go by the university rules. Okay. Um, did that come through over Zoom? Nice. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, HPC accounts are not separate from your main University of Arizona mm -hmm. account. So whatever password, whatever net ID you have for your U of A account, it's going to be exactly the same for the HPC. Uh, and if something happens, if you graduate and leave the university and your normal U of A account disappears, then so does your HPC account. And so they are linked together. Whatever designation the university considers you as, we don't have any separate database. It's the same thing as the main university. Um, let's continue on. So we talked a little bit about groups, ways to organize users on the HPC. Research groups provide uh, HPC account sponsorship if you haven't already attained it. So you can be a member of multiple research groups. A user, normal user can join, you know, if there's two professors in your department that you might want to work with and both of them say that you can join the group, there's nothing preventing you from doing that. Um, you'll just need to talk to each PI about what their preferred way of you using their account is. And that's sort of up to the individual. We make no claim or recommendation on how to use these accounts. That's up to each PI individually. Um, but membership to the group does in principle give you these access. Yes. What would be like an advantage of using two different groups? Well, each group has access to its own CPU time allocation. So if I have a certain amount of hours, you know, if I join one professor's group and they already have a lot of students that are using the HPC and they're running down their hours and they don't really have very many left and I decide, oh, maybe I want to also work with this other professor and then I can use their, this is entirely hypothetical. You will need to talk to each professor individually to determine what their preferred usage of their allocation is. It's entirely up to the individual. Um, just sort of giving an example of a possible configuration, right? Um, I don't want anybody running around and saying like, hey, the guys at the HPC told me I can use your allocation, right? Like, no, this is up to, it's up to them. And do every single professor at U of A get there on time or do you yes. have to, professors have to apply separately if they want to use HPC? Uh, so all they need to do is create an account. Um, each professor, if they so choose, you know, certainly not all professors need the HPC so they don't go and use it. Um, but if the professor wants to use the HPC, all they need to do is create an account and they have the allocation automatically. Um, one sort of caveat to this idea about groups is each PI can create multiple groups, but each PI only receives one allocation. Does that make sense? So you only get a certain number of CPU hours, but if they want to organize their group members in a certain way, they can create multiple different groups, but each of those groups shares the same allocation to compute and storage resources. Uh, and then class groups, we did talk about this, intended for a single semester and provide limited access to compute and storage. So if you somehow join a class group initially, and then you want to use the HPC for research, you'll need to find a research group to join. Uh, so if you are at the University of Arizona, creating your account is pretty straightforward. Go to portal.hpc.arizona.edu. This automatically creates the account for you. Uh, and then step two is sponsorship. This is also an important part. Uh, once you've done the first step, you'll need to get added to that group that we were talking about, right? So you go here, faculty, we'll click this link. Faculty do technically also need to be sponsored, but they can sponsor themselves. Normal users will go to this box and type in their PI, click that button. It'll send you their PI a link. The PI will click that link and then boom, you have access. So there's a few steps to it, but once you have it, you should be good to go. So if you're not at the University of Arizona, uh, if you are a visiting scholar or some other type, we have all sorts of odd situations that pop up. But if you are at some other institution and you're collaborating with somebody here, uh, it is possible for you to join their group, but you need to be registered as a designated campus colleague first. 
And the way to do that is at the university level, we don't manage DCCs directly. So you'll need to go to this link here and request DCC status. So once you've created your account and received sponsorship, you can access the HBC Yay, fireworks. <laughs> okay. So um, I think we've talked about this a little bit before, but let's go. Uh, if you are on Zoom, give a, a check mark reaction if you've already created an account and been sponsored. And if you're here in the room with us, just raise your hand if you've been uh, if you've already created an account and been sponsored. So let's see a handful of hands. I don't see anything on the Zoom, so I don't know. Uh, but hopefully you have been sponsored. Um, okay, cool. Well, if you haven't been sponsored and you have any questions about that, just let us know. So let's talk a little bit about connecting to the HPC. So in order to connect to the HPC, you do have to have an account already. So if you haven't been sponsored by a PI, you'll need to go through the steps that we just talked about in order for any of this stuff to work. So, um, but there are two methods to connect to the HPC. The first is through your browser, through a interface called Open On Demand. And the second method is through the command line, uh, also called a terminal which is just a little application that you can open up on your computer where you type in commands and see a response. Um, so let's go through each of these. Open On Demand is the graphical uh, user portal on the browser. The website is ood.hpc.arizona.edu. This is required for certain graphical applications. For example, if I wanted to use MATLAB, I certainly can use a non-graphical version of MATLAB through the command line, but since the command line is text only, if I wanted to use some of MATLAB's graphical features, I would have to go through Open On Demand. So there are a lot of different uh, features of Open On Demand. You can use the file browser, interactive desktop, the graphical applications, and you also are provided with easy access to a terminal if you don't feel like going through the process on your computer. The downside is that it can be a little bit slow and there's less finer detail of control that you have when you're using open on demand. So for example, if you log on to the terminal, you have all sorts of different commands at your disposal that you can use on open on demand. There's a little bit less fine of control. Yes. When I try that, it just be home directory not found. Is that a uh, so if you if your home directory is not found, you will need to log on via the terminal, I think, right? Uh, and that'll create your home directory and then it should work. Um, so that's, I guess, another step of using the HPC. I is had that... the same problem when I uh, a lot tried doing that too. And then I fixed it though with the terminal thing. Yeah, so if you log on via the terminal, that creates your home directory and then you should have access. I always forget that that's required. So just a, a handful of example applications that are available on open on demand. To be quite honest, I don't know what most of those do, but uh, they are available. Um, here is a screenshot of the interactive desktop. So this is what you would see if you were to open up an interactive desktop session, you can go into your files, use a browser, uh, just interact with the HPC in the same way that you would a normal laptop by you know, using the mouse and the file browser like that. You can also gain access via this button here. So if you go up to the top of Open On Demand, click on clusters and shell access, it will give you a little terminal window without you having to go through terminal application on your computer. So some people prefer doing it this way. There's a lot of different sort of the, the underlying idea behind this is that there's many different ways of accessing the HPC. There's no one correct way. There's just a lot of options and you should just choose whatever works best for you. So this is an option that people like. Um, so let's talk a little bit about command line access. Why should we use command line access? Uh, it's a little bit faster. You get, it's a bit more responsive uh, because as you're communicating with the system, you don't have to waste bandwidth on sending graphical information back and forth. So you have a little bit of a faster response time. You have more control with the use of bash commands. You can write and edit code directly in the terminal using a text editor. Uh, you can manually access the compute nodes and load software, submit batch jobs. You don't need to babysit your session. Uh, the downside here is that uh, it is a slightly steeper learning curve. There's more details to learn, but once you do, uh, you do become a more powerful user in the long run. 
So I would say it's worth it. So what exactly is the command line? It's a text-only interface. It's available on any operating system that you prefer, Mac, Windows, Linux, whatever type of computer you're using, you should be able to access it. it uses something called a scripting language in Windows. It's called PowerShell in Mac and Linux. Uh, it's called Bash or ZSH. Uh, and these, I'm just talking about the command line application on your computer. I'm not talking about the HPC. The HPC runs a Linux operating system. So that's the only way to interact with the HPC is on Linux. But if you have, you know, you can use any type of command line terminal on any type of computer in order to access the HPC. Um, so you connect to your remote server. The HPC is an example of a remote server using the secure shell protocol, also called SSH. Uh, you can access a terminal through OOD, but that's also a program that runs on your personal computer. So hopefully this makes sense. Let's talk a little bit about Bash and Linux. So the HPC runs an operating system called CentOS 7. Uh, it might be upgraded relatively soon, is exactly when. Um, but this is the operating system that you're using on the HPC. So for example, if I have a Windows computer and I'm sitting here using my terminal, I can open up a terminal program on my Windows computer. It might be something like PuTTY. And then I SSH into the HPC. Once I have made that connection to the HPC, now I'm not using my Windows laptop, but I'm using the HPC. So I'm using the Linux operating system on the HPC. So stuff that might work in Windows that you're used to, you'll have to remember that this is not Windows once you have logged onto the HPC. So remember that you're remotely accessing a different computer with a different file system and different installed software. So if I install some program that I wanna use on my Windows laptop and then I log into the HPC, it's not gonna be there because that's a different computer. So the HPC uses bash commands to manage files, you can navigate between directories, anything that you could do in a normal file browser and so much more you can do with Bash. And here is a graphical depiction of the different nodes that are on the HPC. So when you're SSHing, you can imagine you're one of these users that is connecting to, you can see they're all connecting to the Bastion host there. And then that Bastion host connects you to the rest of the system. We'll talk a little bit more in detail about this soon. Uh, and then SSH here, this is what's going on when you are connecting the SSH. You are exchanging information uh, over the network, effectively. So uh, this is what it might look like if you are accessing the HPC. So you see on the top line there, I've typed SSH, that's the command, and then my username at hpc.arizona.edu. Uh, sometimes when you log in, you might see a printed out message. It's very important to pay attention to these and uh, read what it says. So that message says that this is the batch and host used to access the rest of the RT agency environment. Type shell to access the job submission hosts for all environments. So if we go back to this picture here. That tells me that I'm logged on to that batch and host, but that I'm not logged into the rest of the system. So when I go back here, it says type shell. And then if I type shell, this is the message that I see. So there's the command shell. And here is some more information about how to switch which cluster you are accessing. And then down there at the bottom is the prompt. That's what it's called. So you see in parentheses on the left, it says Puma. That's the type uh, uh, that you're on. Then it says your username at, and then some word. So that word here is Wentel Trap. That's one of the two login nodes that we have on the HPC. So whatever comes after that at symbol is the type of node that you're on. So that's very important to pay attention to. So if I go back here, at the very bottom, it says my username at gatekeeper. So that gatekeeper is the name of the bastion host node. So we see their bastion host. So some of these things have a couple of different names that refer to them. Um, gatekeeper is the name of the bastion. host. So if you see gatekeeper, that means you're not on the full HPC system and that you need to type shell in order to access it. Again, we have that cluster. Uh, the two names for the login nodes are Genonia and Wentel Trap. So if you see either of those words coming after your name, you know that you're on the login node. 
Does anybody know what those words are, what they refer to? They are sea snails. Oh, the sea snail. So it's a, it's a shell, right? Sea snails, a little joke. Right? <laughs> um, okay, so once you see the prompt with a login node name, that means you're in. What do you do once you're on the login? So you can use bash commands to manage your files. You can install your code or your software that you need for your research. As we mentioned before, you can install things to directories that you have ownership over, such as your home or some folder in your PI's group directory, something like this. We'll talk more about the storage system next week. Um, you can also, so important little note there, don't compile, uh, uh, compile on a compute node, don't compile on the login node. You can use what we call an interactive session for testing or submit a batch job. And we'll talk more in detail about what those are, not next week, but the week after. So some useful commands on the login node uh, we have here. The name of the cluster will allow you to switch to that cluster. If you type nodes busy, that will give you a graphical depiction of how busy the system is. So let's say I submitted a job and it's not running yet. I can go type nodes busy to see how busy the cluster is. And you know, if it's if it's not running, that probably means the cluster is pretty busy and you'll just have to wait a little while for that to start. And a handful of others here. So U quota will give you a summary of your storage usage. VA stands for view allocation. That gives you a summary of how much CPU time you have used on your current cluster. If you want to see previously run jobs, you can use the past jobs command. If you know a job ID of a particular job and you want to see more details about it, you can use the job history command. Yes. Probably an obvious question, but you probably can't run a direct job. You have to go through a batch job. Yes. Uh, so you wouldn't want to run a job on the login node directly. Uh, so there's two ways of doing that. Um, and yeah, we'll get into details about how to run jobs in our third session. The two main ways to do it would be to use an interactive session, which effectively is you're still submitting a resource request in order to gain access to a compute node. And the batch job is a way of doing that as a scheduled job rather than an interactive job. So there's just two modalities. Do you want your compute node to be an active session where I can type in commands and interact with it in real time? Or do I have my code already set up and ready to go and I just want to submit it and let it run on its own? So those are sort of the two main ways of running the jobs. Um, so one thing that we recommend setting up, uh, not required, but recommended is SSH keys. So these will allow you to access the HPC through your terminal without having to enter your password. And the advantage of this is that, you know, there's certain requirements for your password. You might have some kind of jumble of numbers and symbols and things, and it might be a little bit difficult to type uh, and you might get it wrong. If you get your password wrong three times in a row, you were locked out of the system for an hour, which can be pretty inconvenient. So in order to avoid that type of situation, you can create a SSH key. And we have instructions on our documentation, how to do this. Uh, SSH keys are also a very commonly used thing. So if you just Google it, it will show up, but we have particular instructions on our documentation as well. So let's check in with what we've talked about so far, um, so we've talked about using open on demand as a way to access the HPC. So why don't we name one advantage and one disadvantage or one pro and one con of using open on demand. Feel free to just shout it out if you're on Zoom or if you're in here. It's faster. It's actually not faster. It's easier to access. So it's faster in that sense that um, I can open up a program more quickly just by typing. Uh, just by clicking on it through the browser interface, but generally uh, it's a little bit laggier. Not, it's not too bad, but it's a little bit laggy in the terminal. <laughs> Any others? What's a, what's an advantage of open on? The the exactly. So if I need to. You know, maybe I'm doing some type of fluid dynamics modeling and I have a 3D type of 
thing that I'm looking at, this might be an example of a use case where you would want to have graphical feedback on the job that you're working on. So in that case, you would want to use open on. Um, just get past this and get into the system layout. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about the node types and the architecture of the HPC. So here is a very general uh, diagram of the architecture of a supercomputer. So pretty much every supercomputer works like this. So going from the very smallest thing to the largest thing, Inside of the CPUs, there are things called cores. A sort of caveat to this terminology is that our job scheduler, it's called Slurm. It sort of interchanges these words. So a core and a CPU to Slurm are the same thing. Uh, but when you're talking about hardware, a CPU is usually the larger chip. And then you could have like an eight core CPU, right? So one CPU with eight cores. But on Slurm, it would say that there are eight CPUs. Just a minor um, thing with the terminology there. But from a hardware perspective, yes, correct. Yeah, yeah. so it's like we can only request one core. You can request multiple, multiple cores. Multiple. Yeah. Each core is kind of multiple CPUs. So um, again, be clear about whether you're talking about it from a hardware perspective or from the scheduler's perspective. So from a hardware perspective, each CPU has multiple cores. From the scheduler's perspective, CPU and core are the same thing. So if I wanted eight cores, maybe, for example, if we're talking about a, a computer that has a CPU that has eight cores, from a hardware perspective, I would have one CPU and eight cores. Um, but from a Slurm perspective, so if I was going into open on demand and choosing the number of CPUs that I wanted, I would put eight there, right? So um, from a user's perspective, I don't really care about how it's structured. And so eight, the number I put in is the upper limit of how much parallelization I can do. Exactly. Okay. Yes, that's correct. And that's the number Slurm care about. Exactly. I see. Yes, so from a user perspective, CPU and core are the same thing, but from a strict hardware perspective, there's an extra subdivision in there, just to be aware of. Uh, and then inside of a node, you have a certain number of CPUs and cores. Each of these are connected to a shared memory area. And then above that, you have nodes that are all interconnected with each other and that can access a shared file system. So it's sort of this hierarchical structure of interconnection between cores and memory that you have inside of a supercomputer. So with that in mind, here is our architecture of the UA HPC system. So we have compute nodes on the right. There's a lot of those. Uh, these compute nodes are connected to the shared data storage. The login node is also connected to the shared data storage. You might notice that the bastion host is only connected to the login node. These connections here are important. The bastion host is not connected to the compute nodes and the bastion host is not connected to the shared data storage. So that's a common mistake. You know, if you're on the bastion host and you're, you know, you're like, where are all my files? Remember, it's not connected to the main data storage. Uh, and then we have one other last type of node on the bottom left, that's the file transfer node. So that's connected to the outside as well as to the shared data storage. So this is what you might want to use if you are transferring data from your laptop or from another external server onto the HPC. So this is what handles, as its name suggests, file transfers. So let's go through each of these in slightly more detail. The Bastion host, I feel like I've talked about this quite a bit at this point. So the host name is gatekeeper, no file storage, no compute. The only thing to do here is type shell to access the login nodes. <laughs> so, if you would like to set up an SSH connection to the HPC, it is possible to jump past the Bastion host, which effectively means that it just saves you an extra command that you can type. So this would be the syntax that you would use, SSH-J, jump server to remote server. So an example of what this might look like, SSH-J, user at hpc.arizona.edu. That backslash is just to indicate a line break. It shouldn't actually be there if you're typing this out. And then 
user etch. So you see the second one has shell.hpc.version.ru. So this would be a way of just typing in a single command rather than having limited to two commands. And it is also possible to use SSH configuration to save your host names and your proxy jumps. Um, once you get that all set up, for me, I just have it so that I type on my computer HPC, hit enter, and then it, I'm automatically logged in. I don't have to type my password or anything. It's really convenient. So I definitely recommend if you're going to be SSHing into the HPC frequently to set up things like this to make it uh, both more secure and faster. So again, this method pairs nicely with SSH keys. OK, so the login node. There are two login nodes. Yeah, quite a good question about that. With SSH keys, do you know do you need to pass two-factor authentication? Uh, I believe the S yeah, I don't need to. So whenever I log in, I don't have to do uh, two-factor authentication. So there's, I don't know exactly what's going on behind the scenes, but if you have them set up correctly, you don't need to do two-factor authentication. Um, okay. Login nodes. So these are for file management and job submission. Uh, the host names, as we talked about before, Genonia and Wentel Trap, the names of the C snails. The domain for the login node is shell.hpc.arizona.edu. So this allows you to access the main HPC file system. So there are three shares within that file system, home groups and Exodus. Uh, we'll get into a lot more details about the file system next week. Uh, and from here, you can also submit your interactive or batch jobs in order to access the compute node. So remember, the login node is not intended to uh, run computations on. It says no compute there. Uh, so you use the login node to submit requests for computation. That's important. OK. And we have. Now, the compute nodes. So these are the workhorses of the HPC. This is probably what people are talking about when you imagine just saying supercomputer. This is where all of those computers are. This is the bulk of the physical volume of the HPC, as well as where most jobs are running, or all jobs are running. So it's only accessible via some type of job request. So whether that be a uh, when you go on open on demand and you fill out that form that has all of the resources in it, whether that's typing the interactive command, whether that's typing the S batch command, these are all types of job requests. And the PI will use their CPU time allocation in order to pay. Pay is in quotation marks because it doesn't require real money. It's just this CPU time allocation uh, on the standard partition. Uh, there are all, there's another type of partition called windfall. We'll get more into these details when we talk about running jobs, interactive sessions, batch jobs. We've mentioned these things. Uh, and that's what the compute nodes do. So the compute nodes, submit a resource request, get your job running on the compute nodes. File transfer node, last type of node. Uh, the name is pretty self-explanatory. It allows you to transfer files at a faster rate than otherwise. So the domain is filexpr at hpc.arizona.edu. So if I wanted to access that node, I can. So in this example, what we're talking about is if I have already SSH'd onto the HPC and I'm on my login node, from there, I can type this command, ssh filexpr.hpc.arizona.edu, and that will allow me to access the file transfer node. And then from there, if I have some data that I want to download, I can go download it uh, and save it to my directories. So it's important to notice the login node is connected to the shared data storage. The file transfer node is also connected to the shared data storage. So both of them have access to the same storage, the same hard drives, right? So you know, thinking about which nodes are connected to which file systems is important to remember. So when I get to the file transfer node, uh, it still allows me to access all of the same files that I would otherwise from logging into the computer. <laughs> so it's also good for uh, transferring files from a laptop. 
Uh, there's another file system called Rental that's not on this image. We'll talk about that next week, but uh, it's not connected to the main HPC system. It's only connected through the file transfer node. So if I wanted to move some data from my rental storage onto the main HPC storage, it would need to go through the file transfer node. Okay, so those are all of the different types of nodes that we have. Um, which type of node has access to the main file system but should not be used to run jobs? Yes? The login node. Exactly, the login node. Yeah. How about which type of node should be used when uploading data to HPC? Anyone? Last one. Yeah, no one else seems to be taking it. It's an easy one, guys. You know it. Come on, somebody. File transfer node. The file transfer node, exactly. Um, okay. Back up. File transfer node. Okay, how are we doing on time? Let's see. It looks like it's out of the clock. It's 11.54. Okay, perfect. Um, so here's our final activity. Uh, so if you do have an HPC account, let's just try right now to log in to open on demand and log in via the terminal. So some of you have mentioned that you've done this before, so it should be a breeze. Uh, if you don't have an HPC account, then you can uh, start following the instructions that we have on our website, uh, which will effectively just means logging into the portal and then requesting sponsorship. So if you don't already have a sponsor, you know you need to go talk to some PI and get that taken care of. But uh, and this is our this is our last uh, activity. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I think I meant to put something in there about how to contact us, but um, yes. So uh, this is our HPC consult team, Chris Reedy, Derek Twickle, Sarah Willis. I don't know why you're sitting here. <laughs> I'm is this your staff? No, 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 no I'm, I'm kidding. I'm not, I'm kidding. Um, uh, my name is Ethan. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be the same time. Right. Same time. So we'll be back next week. It'll still be in this room. Um, based on the attendance that I see here, I think we can all fit in the Weaver Science uh, and Engineering library that we had originally booked. So um, keep an eye out. I'll be sending emails to those who registered for each workshop um, with a reminder. All of the information. So. Thank you. Yes. I don't work at Stewart. Okay. I work at the HPC. Um, but uh, yeah, my back, my PhD was. Okay. I just started my PhD. Oh, nice. Started nice. What was your name? Neve. Neve. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I just post one. Yeah. 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 They're uh, we they use the HPC quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. I realized I already have an account. I was not sure. Oh, my yeah. advisor and yeah. said that it's already been created. Oh, nice. I will say. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, did you, like, did you have, did I did you my PhD at UC Riverside. Oh, okay. Yeah. What did you do? Um, so my research was uh I was did computational things. Yeah. So uh I was in galaxy formation, so I was looking at the creation mm -hmm. and formation of fourth galaxies, in mm -hmm. particular yeah. ones yes, that are similar to the Magellanic Bugs. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. No. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for coming. You guys have to connect to the internet. Are these slides going to be shared with us? Yes. All right. Thanks for coming. Yeah, it's still like 20. <laughs>